Well, President Trump says he's going to have the name of the nominee for SCOTUS on Saturday at five o'clock, I think he said. So we're going to be waiting for that. But in the meantime, we can go through some of the chatter that's out there about it. And I think you'll find some of these articles and different tweets and things very interesting. So stick with me, folks, and I'll be right back. Hey, everybody, this is Deb with Truthfication Chronicles. And oh, wow, you know, it's just really starting to heat up out there about the SCOTUS battle. And uh, we're going to talk about that in just a second here. But I wanted to show you this because you may not know this took place. It was only seven minutes long. And uh, this was a speech President Trump gave to the 75th session of the United Nations General Assembly. Now, I'm not going to play it all for you, but I will leave the link down below so you can watch the full thing. But I wanted to play this part in particular for you. So here we go. Those who attack America's exceptional environmental record while ignoring China's rampant pollution are not interested in the environment. They only want to punish America, and I will not stand for it. If the United Nations is to be an effective organization, it must focus on the real problems of the world. This includes terrorism, the oppression of women, forced labor, drug trafficking, human and sex trafficking, religious persecution, and the ethnic cleansing of religious minorities. America will always be a leader in human rights. My administration is advancing religious liberty, opportunity for women, the decriminalization of homosexuality, combating human trafficking, and protecting unborn children. We also know that American prosperity is the bedrock of freedom and security all over the world. In three short years, we built the greatest economy in history, and we are quickly doing it again. Our military has increased substantially in size. We spent $2.5 trillion over the last four years on our military. We have the most powerful military anywhere in the world, and it's not even close. We stood up to decades of China's trade abuses. We revitalized the NATO alliance, where other countries are now paying a much more fair share. We forged historic partnerships with Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador to stop human smuggling. We are standing with the people of Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela in their righteous struggle for freedom. We withdrew from the terrible Iran nuclear deal and imposed crippling sanctions on the world's leading state sponsor of terror. We obliterated the ISIS caliphate 100 percent, killed its founder and leader, al-Baghdadi, and eliminated the world's top terrorist, Qasim Soleimani. This month, we achieved a peace deal between Serbia and Kosovo. We reached a landmark breakthrough with two peace deals in the Middle East after decades of no progress. Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain all signed a historic peace agreement in the White House with many other Middle Eastern countries to come. They are coming fast, and they know it's great for them, and it's great for the world. These groundbreaking peace deals are the dawn of the new Middle East. By taking a different approach, we have achieved different outcomes far superior outcomes. We took an approach, and the approach worked. We intend to deliver more peace agreements shortly, and I have never been more optimistic for the future of the region. There is no blood in the sand. Those days are hopefully over. As we speak, the United States is also working to end the war in Afghanistan, and we are bringing our troops home. America is fulfilling our destiny as peacemaker, but it is peace through strength. We are stronger now than ever before. Our weapons are at an advanced level like we've never had before, like, frankly, we've never even thought of having before. And I only pray to God that we never have to use them. For decades, the same tired voices proposed the same failed solutions, pursuing global ambitions at the expense of their own people. But only when you take care of your own citizens will you find a true basis for cooperation. As President, I have rejected the failed approaches of the past, and I am proudly putting America first, just as you should be putting your countries first. 
That's okay. That's what you should be doing. I am supremely confident that next year, when we gather in person, we will be in the midst of one of the greatest years in our history, and frankly, hopefully, in the history of the world. Thank you. God bless you all. God bless America. And God bless the United Nations. Boom. <laughs> I didn't play the whole thing, but at the beginning, he was talking about China and how China should be held accountable for the China virus. So, uh, but I wanted to play that part for you because I thought it's a very powerful speech there that he made. I'm sure there's a lot of globalists that were none too happy with that speech. So I just thought I'd share it with you because, you know, we're in just such a weird time in our world where you have to do the United Nations by um, <laughs> long distance here. But that's okay. He got his message across. I think he did an excellent job. That's really, you know, he worked on that speech. He practiced that one a lot. There, i contrasting it to what, you know, he sounds like when he's talking at one of the rallies. And he, he did the presidential thing on this one, that's for sure. And he knew what he wanted to say, and he said it, and he said it very well, I thought. Whoever wrote that speech, good job. So anyway, I wanted to share that with you. The link will be down below. You can watch the whole thing. Then I wanted to point this out to you. Okay, guys, this is not Kaylee McEnany's feed. Okay, this is not her Twitter account. Even it, I don't care that it says White House Press Secretary because it's not because down here it says unofficial account parody support commentary. So, um, you know, this is not her. All right. In the way that you notice, if you look down here very carefully at the at sign and look how it's spelled, it's not spelled correctly. First of all, it's McEnany with an A-N-Y at the end, and then uh, Kaylee is not spelled right. It has an L instead of an I there. So uh, keep your eye out for people like that. You know, um, I don't know who it is that's doing this. I really don't know that it's somebody I want to follow. I mean, they've been saying positive things about Trump, but still, I just don't like the whole perspective of it. But that's me. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because in my last video, I gave a shout out to, I thought, the salon owner out in California, the one that, you know, uh, put the video out about Nancy Pelosi. I'm not sure that account is valid. All right, I'm going to take the link off of the last video just because, uh, you know, I'll put a disclaimer thing there because I've had a, two or three people in the comments tell me that she said, the salon owner said, that's not her. But I need to see her saying it. So if you've got a link to her saying it, a clip or something, or some kind of statement somehow that can validate that, I'd like to see it. All right. It doesn't necessarily mean I don't believe you. It's just, you know me, I like to have the proof. So I just wanted to point that out with this particular thing. And that's the main reason that I brought this up to you. Just be careful if you're out there on Twitter, because there are lots of them who are um, claiming to be parody accounts. It didn't say that before. Um, I went through when I saw it, I checked her out because there's no blue check here. And then I saw that the the name was misspelled down here. And so I went through a lot of people were, you know, you know, following her because she told them to follow her and they did. And she got a whole ton of follows then. And that's just not the way to do it. So a lot of people abandoned ship after I posted on it. And so, you know, that's just, again, not the way to do it. You can do something like this, but... Um, I don't know. I don't know how fair that is. Anyway, let's go on. Oh, look what's trending. Oh, that's interesting. Um, there, what's really interesting is that trending has not been something that has been very, uh, let's just see. <laughs> um, is currently trending. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. So, uh, looks like I'm going to have to explore this. I'm sorry. I didn't really plan on that. I didn't see that it was trending. It, it's really interesting how this used to be trending and now they've changed it with what's happening. 
this is different. This is different than it used to be. And I think that is so things that they don't want to have trend are not going to trend and it's not going to be so obvious. So I just think that's really bizarre that they did that. And, um, you know, the thing is, guys, part of the reasons for the stupid questions is because people read more into what um, Mr. 17 has said. You know, they put words in his mouth and they made assumptions that are not necessarily true or that we don't have proof enough of. So, you know, just be really careful because it gives them a bad name when you jump to conclusions that aren't supported by any evidence. I mean, I know there are some things that are going to come out that we know are there, but anyway, okay, back to what I'm talking about, because that really was just an aside that I didn't notice was going on. Anyway, let's go to some Catherine Herridge things. First of all, she says, a source close to White House tells CBS News that every signal, every indicator favors Judge Amy Coney Barrett. Based on the buzz within the White House, the source said it would be extraordinarily surprising if she were not the choice. Part of the political calculus White House anticipates. Okay, well, be interesting. Democrats will go overboard and pile on an ACB nomination, noting the 2017 line of questioning from Senator Feinstein and other Democrats about religion did not play well according to polling. This source said some within White House want President Trump to announce before Saturday. He has said, I mean, he just said at a press conference today, well, it was one of those walking out to the helicopter things. And he said Saturday at five is when they're planning on making that announcement. But anyway, so um, interesting on that. And then she had this letter to Senate Judiciary Democrats from Chairman Lindsey Graham after the treatment of Justice Kavanaugh. I now have a different view of the judicial confirmation process. Compare the treatment of Robert Bork, Clarence Thomas, Samuel Leto, and Brett Kavanaugh to that of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan. Plus, it's clear that there already is one set of rules for a Republican president and one set of rules for a Democrat president. I therefore think it's important that we proceed expeditiously to process any nomination made by President Trump to fill this vacancy. And so the full letter is here. Um, they put it out under the Senate Judiciary here. He put a link to it. Here's the actual letter right here. And uh, it's going to go to these people. Feinstein, Leahy, Durbin, White House, Klobuchar, Coons, Blumenthal, Hirono, Booker, and Harris. What a lineup. Oh, oh I just don't want to watch them in some kind of hearing. Like millions of Americans, I was shocked and saddened to hear of Justice Ginsburg's death. Justice Ginsburg served honorably on the federal bench and was a trailblazer for women in the law. She will be missed. When the American people elected a Republican Senate majority in 2014, Americans did so because we committed to checking and balancing the end of President Obama's lame duck presidency. Now, it's really weird, folks, because they keep calling President Trump a lame duck. He's not. A lame duck is where you no longer can run for president anymore. It happens at the end of your second term because you can only be elected president twice. That's all there is. And you can only be a lame duck then in your second term. You can't be a lame duck when you're running to be reelected. Uh, I don't know why they use that term. I can't remember who I heard it from, but it was like it was a, a somebody who was a liberal. And it's like, no, no, that's not a lame duck. We did so, which trying to keep his power checked and balanced. We've followed the precedent that the Senate has followed for 140 years since the 1880s. No Senate has confirmed an opposite party president's Supreme Court nominee during an election year. Because our Senate majority committed to confirming President Trump's excellent judicial nominees, and particularly because we committed to supporting his Supreme Court nominees, the American people expanded the Republican majority in 2018. We should honor that mandate. And it, he's talking about the Senate majority because we did get, you know, we gained a couple more there. We should honor that mandate. Also, unlike in 2016, President Trump is currently standing for re-election. 
the people will have a say in his choices. Lastly, after the treatment, and here's where he says that paragraph she was quoting. Lastly, after the treatment of Justice Kavanaugh, I now have a different view of the judicial confirmation process. I, you know, I think what he's trying to do is to keep it from becoming a circus and not turn into Kavanaugh part two, which would just be awful. Um, you know, it was awful the first time. That was just the worst thing. I, I felt so bad for that man and his family. Uh, I prayed a lot for him. I still do because that hasn't gone away. That hurt is still there and I'm sure he deals with it all the time. I think, therefore, it is important that we proceed expeditiously to process any nomination made by President Trump to fill this vacancy. I am certain if the shoe were on the other foot, you would do the same, which is very true. They wouldn't hesitate one little bit. Well, back here on this, um, she had that statement. And then down here, this guy says, thank you, Lindsey Graham. Finally, the Republicans are fighting back against the underhanded, immoral and illegal tactics that the Democrats have been utilizing for decades by using their constitutional and lawful powers to proceed with filling this Supreme Court vacancy. I agree with it. See, this is the difference. <laughs> Plain and simple. The Democrats are saying, well, you know, if we can't do it legally, then we will find some way to do an end run around it. And for the Republicans, they're going, no, this is what the Constitution says. This is what we will do. So there is a huge difference between the two parties. And I really wish more of the liberals would start to see that. What's really ironic to me is that the Democrat Party was the party that's been running around spouting, nobody is above the law. Nobody is above the law. I mean, you know, there for a while, especially with that impeachment, if you were a drinking person, you could play a drinking game with that and you'd have been soused all the time. Maybe that's what Nancy Pelosi did. I don't know. So I thought that was a really good tweet there that you needed to see. All right. And then here is Mitt Romney's statement. I wouldn't get too excited about this yet. Okay. But he's saying it, you know, that he is not going to block the vote. He says, I intend to vote based upon their qualifications. Okay. So, uh, you know, he's leaving it open there he could still say no, but I don't think it matters. Like I said, even if he says no, we still have 50 votes. Um, you know, it'd be 50 to 50 if he would happen to vote with the Democrats and then the other two would vote with him too. Then, um, you know, Mike Pence would step in and break the tie. So we still have the ability to do it. So anyway, um, wanted to share that with you. And then I have an article here that was pretty good about uh, Amy Coney Barrett. And it says why she's the hands down best pick to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And there's a lot of information about her. You know, she has seven kids. Well, one of them is uh, her own that has a learning disability, some kind of disability. And then she has two that she uh, that they adopted, I believe. But anyway, I thought this was really interesting down here. Um, you know, it says her rare combination of hyper intelligence and humility is a matter of bipartisan consensus. The smartest person in the room and also the most humble was how Sneed and two other sources intimately familiar with Barrett described her echoing each other almost verbatim. Harvard Law School prof Noah Feldman, a liberal who testified before Congress in favor of impeaching the president. Yeah, I remember that guy hailed her as a truly brilliant lawyer. In a 2018 column, Feldman should know he and Barrett were members of the same class of Supreme Court clerks in 1998. She was one of the two best lawyers of the 40 clerks and arguably the single best, Feldman concluded. She has legally prepared enough to go on to the court 20 years ago. So um, he spoke very highly. And, you know, the entire Notre Dame law faculty likewise endorse her. And that includes people who identify as liberal. So it, this says, you know, a lot of people think very highly of her.
that she is very skilled. But here's somebody who's uh, not quite so enthralled with her. This is Robert Barnes from Barnes Law. And, you know, he has done some of the higher profile cases. I think he used to work with Lynn Wood, but I think they had a parting of the ways as far as I can glean. But, you know, they were doing some of the defense of people that were being slandered um, or libel, whichever it is. I can never remember um, because of different things, you know, for political reasons. So um, this thread right here, he gives reasons why he thinks she's not suitable. She's not a good choice. Obviously, he is um, somebody who favors the Barbara Lagoa, if that's how you pronounce it. And so um, he goes through and he says that she sided with the government on almost every civil rights case, every big employer case, every criminal case, while also siding with the government on the lockdowns, on uncompensated takings, on excusing First Amendment infringements and Fourth Amendment violations. And again, he goes on, he does like he's got articles here that he includes. He has cases that he's talking about. And, um, you know, he points out the different cases here. So it's an interesting thread. I don't know. Um, he definitely doesn't think that she should get the job. Uh, he has more experience with that than I do, but you compare the two article, you know, this article back here along with this, it's just kind of interesting and different. But anyway, what I really think we ought to do or the Senate ought to do is what Rush Limbaugh suggested the other day. And here's the transcript of it. If you don't know, you can always read the transcripts from his, um, you know, regular show. They usually put them up. They don't always put up every single segment. So, you, you know, um, I wish they did. But anyway, so his idea right here was... We obvious, we've obviously got the votes, so what's the point of the hearing? The point I made yesterday is we don't need to open this up so that whatever the nominee is can be Kavanaugh or Borked or Thomason. And I didn't know this, but Trump himself retweeted my point this morning. Rush Limbaugh calls for Trump Supreme Court nomination to skip the Judiciary Committee hearings and go straight to a floor vote. And they actually quote me accurately here. So... This is the thing, you know, there is no ruling in the Constitution or in the Senate rules that say that they have to have a hearing. Now, I don't know if you know, but when they have somebody up for a judgeship, and it doesn't matter if it's one of the lower court judges or in this case, a justice of the Supreme Court, they send in volumes of stuff. I mean, rulings that they have done. Uh, cases they've argued, articles they've written. I mean, it's a huge file. Chances are very good that that file will be um, available on the judiciary site. Uh, it was for Kavanaugh, and you could go in and you could read a lot of it. I mean, they give them a questionnaire that they have to fill out, and you can read what their responses were to the questionnaire. But a lot of it has to do with their publications and, like I said, their rulings in lower courts and stuff like that. So, you know, it's quite an extensive file. The Democrats, of course, will be going through it with a fine tooth comb to try to find something they can, you know, attack her on. And I'll tell you, if they attack her on her Catholicism, on her faith, they're going to be in trouble because a big portion of Catholics vote Democrat. And I think if they start seeing, which I never understood, by the way, uh, because I would think that Catholics would be very conservative in with their votes, but that never seemed to, to fit, I guess. I don't know. But if you look at their base, it's almost like they're going through and doing something purposely to offend big portions of their base. So, I mean, you know, they've let this thing go on in these different Democrat cities where primarily businesses that are owned by blacks have been just annihilated from all this. They've been looted and burned and everything. And so it's really hurt the black community. So it's almost like the Democrats are going, we don't care. 
you're going to vote for us anyway, which should make all of the people that were business owners there and who lost, you know, businesses around them that they frequented, they really need to think twice about putting those people back in power because they're not doing them any favors. So um, anyway, I just think it's kind of funny that they offended, you know, a lot of black people. They really have. Well, you know, with Joe and all of his gaffes, that's been part of it, too. And then um, with the Hispanics, too, you know, they they take them for granted. They assume they're going to vote Democrat. And so they feel like they can do anything at all to them. And if they do this with the Catholics, I'm telling you, it's going to come back to bite them in the butt big time. Because I don't think Catholics are going to stand for it if they watch this woman be attacked, you know, like the Democrats would if there was a hearing. I also think that there is another factor that needs to be considered with this that I think is really important. It's not so much... Um, you know, timing, that's part of it because it does take longer when you have to do the hearings. But there's a real factor in there with the, uh, the attacks on the integrity of someone who's going to be on the Supreme Court. And I think, you know, with Kavanaugh, what they did was they threw all these lies out there about him. And there are still people out there who believe those lies. I can't believe they do, but they do. And so, you know, it's all just, it was so totally bogus. And yet people still believe it because that's what they saw the Democrats repeating over and over and over and over again. And that's what the Democrats plan on doing, I'm sure, with this lady. So I think it would be best for our country to not just allow them to mercilessly attack a Supreme Court justice nominee. I just think that that shouldn't happen because right now we're going to need that Supreme Court. We're going to need to trust it because I guarantee this election result is going to go to the SCOTUS. I guarantee. Um, It it just is. They already have it planned. That's what's going to happen. So uh, this was just interesting what Rush had to say here. And so I thought I would uh, put that down there. I think he said basically the same thing that you don't have to do it. There's no need for the hearings. They will have the files, the massive amount of files. They can give them several days to go through it. And, you know, the people in their staff can do that and then vote. Take the vote because you know what? Nobody's vote's going to change nobody's going to be swayed. And the only thing it'll serve to do having a hearing is to denigrate this woman and to smear her name, even though there's nothing there. And that's what they intend to do. I would take that arrow out of that quiver. I don't think Nancy's got near as many arrows in that quiver as she thinks. She might want to look. (laughs) Because I think it's getting pretty empty. And that's what, you know... Somebody in the comments was mentioning that President Trump shouldn't choose a candidate just because uh, she's a woman. But I got to tell you, this is not gender politics, okay? It's not identity politics here. What it is, is taking the ammunition away from the Democrats because they've used this whole Me Too thing, what they did to Kavanaugh, He's not the first person they've done that to. Remember, Clarence Thomas, oh, and you had Bork. You know, that's where the whole word came from, being Borked. And we don't need to see another justice nomination Borked. We don't. So I think this is a actually a very good idea, and I think it's probably what they're going to end up doing because there's just no need for it, and you know what's going to happen. We all know what's going to happen. All it's going to be is a lot of baseless claims and reclaiming my time, reclaiming my time. We know we've seen that before. They're not going to be asking questions. They're going to be making accusations against the person. And then they're not going to give them time to respond. We've seen that playbook before. So bypassing it, I think is a very, very good thing. It stops them from being able to use those tactics. 
and they're not going to like it. Let's face it, they're not going to like it no matter what. They're not. And I'm going to do another video, a separate one, on some of the things that are being said on Twitter, okay? Because that deserves one all in its own. You've got to see some of the things that they're saying out there. Which, if any of us said it, of course, we'd be, you know, in jail already. But, oh no, they seem to get away with it all, right? So anyway, that's what I've got for you on this one. I don't have a shout out. I just wanted to point out the last shout out I messed up on. So, or at least I think I did. I still totally don't know if that was her or not. I think probably it's not. But um, again, I don't have any documentation either way. And before I go, I want to tell you that I think... Eric and I have got it worked out, so Friday night at 9 o'clock, we can have another uh, live stream. All right, now I have no idea if President Trump is going to be doing a rally. I haven't looked, so I, I will look, but you know, it's going to be hard to do one on a night he's not doing a rally because he seems to be doing an awful lot of rallies lately. So I doubt if I can um, work around it, and we'll just have to do what we can do and we'll see what everybody uh, has to say about it right and you know if you can join me you can join me if you can't then you can watch it later so we're trying to get all the little bugs worked out and you know somebody questioned why why do live streams and it's like because I like interacting with you people I'm gonna figure out how to do this with you know the questions the comments and things so I can see them better somebody said to use my phone and I may do that my phone's not a very big screen and I'm old, so <laughs> I'm not sure how that's going to work, but I will have a way. We'll figure it out. Okay. We were a little pressed for time. We had some things that happened last time that were just a surprise. So, uh, set us back quite a bit. And so this time I think we'll be much better prepared and we'll know what we're doing. <laughs> Hopefully, but it's still a learning process. And anyway, I hope you all can maybe join us on Friday night, 9 o'clock Eastern, and uh, we'll have some fun. Even if we just get to sit and chat and whatever, that'll be nice. And, you know, I just had trouble. I couldn't type fast enough last time to keep up with everybody that was making comments to me. So it'll be much, much better if I'm just reading the screen and answering questions that way. Okay? So anyway, that's what I've got for you on this one. I want to thank you for stopping by. And I'll see y'all later.